Pleasure to welcome you to the Bridge Church this morning. Uh, my name is Sean Prospect and I represent the men's ministry. Each Sunday we offer services at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Uh, the 10.30 a.m. service is also streaming, so for those of you online, welcome and thank you for joining us. If this is your first time, uh, we ask that you look in your seat backs, and for those of you online, you can scroll down to the menu and there's a link, and look for our Connect card. The Connect card is where you can provide us with your information so we can learn more about you, how you found us, and how to contact you so we can be in constant communication. If you're a returner um, and your contact information has changed, we ask that you fill this out to make sure that we have the right information. And this is also a great place for your prayer requests as well. Just fill it out and put it back in the kiosk. Now, there's a lot happening at the Bridge Church all the time for every age group. And there's three ways that you can find out about these things. One. Um, is go to our website, gobridgechurch.org, and click on upcoming events, and you can see a wide variety of activities, whether it's life groups, programs, outreach programs, men's ministry, women's ministry. Um, check it out. Two, make sure your email address is accurate and check your email. Um, we send out periodic messages every week. Then lastly, you can go to the back, and we have different st stations and tables where you can talk to someone and find out what we're doing. But in essence, there's something for everybody, and church isn't a one-day thing. It's where we get together and we, we grow together. We need you. You need us. Um, we're a family. And lastly, if you woke up this morning and nobody told the words, I love you, please know that we love you here at the bridge, and it's a God that loves you more than you can ever imagine. So thank you all for coming this morning, and please gaze your attention to the baptistry. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. One of the very, very special privileges that we have as a church and the body of Christ is to witness when people come to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. The Bible teaches very clearly that water baptism doesn't save us. It doesn't keep us saved. It doesn't wash away all of our sins, or any of them for that matter. All of our sins were washed away by the blood of Jesus when he died on that cross. But this is a time when an individual comes to declare publicly Yes, I have trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and it's my desire to walk in obedience to the best of my ability each and every day. It's done publicly so that we as brothers and sisters in Christ can pray for and encourage these individuals in any way, shape, or form that we can to encourage and help them on this journey. And it is especially, for me, especially um, a great time when one of our young people come. These young people are the future of our church, the future leaders here. Um, for the church as we move forward. And so join me in welcoming Queen Esther Udabe as she comes to be baptized. Queen 
yesterday you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And it's your desire to walk in obedience to the best of your ability yes. each and every day? Yes. Upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and in obedience to the Lord's command, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray for Queen Esther as she continues in her growth and her relationship with the Lord. Let's go, Father, in prayer. Our gracious, loving Father, we thank you so very much just for this time to gather together as your children. Father, to witness a believer, a young person coming forward to testify publicly that they have trusted Jesus the Savior. It's their desire to walk in obedience to the best of their ability. We pray for Queen Esther, pray for Tavares and Felicia and the other youth leaders as they help and encourage her in this journey. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to serve you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence here. Ask your blessing as we continue to worship and celebrate Jesus. For it's in his precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys ready to continue worshiping this morning? We invite you to stand if you like, sit if you like, however you feel comfortable. We're going to teach you a new song this morning. The past couple weeks, Pastor was talking about real worship and reminding us that we should come ready. We should bring our hearts and our minds ready to church to worship amongst our fellow brothers and sisters. And part of what helps us prepare to do that is to think about who we're worshiping. Who he is, he's our king, he's our Lord, he's our protector, he's our provider, he's our comfort, he's our strength. When we start to think about who he is, I don't know about you, but I can't help but worship. So we invite you guys, we're going to teach you a new song. It's pretty catchy, I think you'll be able to catch on. But let's just enter into a time of worship of our King.
come to adore him this morning? Are you reminded of how good he is? Let's declare our love and our gratefulness as we continue singing.
that you see our hearts of praise this morning. Sincere praise to you. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must stand. But you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I've nothing else fit for Except for heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one love, with my arms stretched wide, how I wish it You're worthy of it all. 
You are so deserving of every breath that we can give back to you in honor of you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to approach you, to commune with you. Thank you for receiving our praise this morning. some new members into the Bridge family. It's always exciting to me because membership means that these folks want to become more committed to the Bridge. They already know it's a church. Now they want to serve more. They want to give more. They want to have a greater impact. And so that always excites me because that means they're taking their next step, not just with the Bridge, but with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope you'll be as excited with me as we welcome these new members. Searching Let's give them all a hand. You know, what I said in the beginning of that video, I really meant because it's always a thrill for me when people take their next step to become a formal member of the Bridge Church. And what is that? That is being willing to take more responsibility, being more supportive, serving, giving, praying, helping us to accomplish our mission, which is to be God's bridge to all people, a span across the gap of where they are now to where God created them to be. All in favor of receiving those as presented in the video into the formal membership of the Bridge Church, signified by a hearty amen. Amen. Any opposed? By a nay. I thought not. So we welcome them into the formal membership of the Bridge Church. Let's welcome them again, can we? So much has been going on around here uh, this weekend already. Yesterday, we had a wonderful senior care expo here at the church. There were all kinds of organizations here. Uh, those who came uh, from our church and from the public all said it was a really worthwhile experience. And they were able to kind of do one-stop shopping uh, of all the different needs of uh, people who are aging and people who are preparing for age, and people who are taking care of those who are in their twilight years. And so I want to thank everyone who had a part with that, Denise Simmons and, and all the folks who came and helped with that great, great uh, program. And then our South Africa team got home safe last night. So they're here. Great to have them. I'm going to invite now our staff to come up if they would, and join me on the platform. This is our, our church ministry staff. Several weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, you might know because you may have celebrated at work, was e Employee Appreciation Day. And this is kind of the month of March, Employee Appreciation Month. Now, in October, we celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month, and we're always so touched as pastors for your love and your support and your demonstrations of support to us. At the same time, we know as pastors that we don't make this happen alone. It takes an amazing staff of dedicated people who work so hard day in and day out to have all the ministries that the bridge offers within our church, in the external ministries, international ministries, and these are the folks who make it happen. We pastors could not nearly do a knife without these amazing people. And so I want to recognize them. First, Ceci Cabrera. 
Fessy is our first impressions director, which all the people who welcome you in and the people in the lobby and the people all over, that's who coordinates that ministry. She's our front office manager. She's our missions director. Uh, she's kind of a right-hand person to me, and uh, she just does so, so much. So thank Ceci with me. <laughs> then we have Sonia Kiley. <laughs> and you know mostly her for being our worship leader, but she does so much more than that. I cannot even begin to tell you all the things. She's our publications director. Uh, she does so so many different things here at the church, behind the scenes, and, and, and helping things get organized and helping things get run properly. And she just is an amazing addition to our team. Thanks, Sonia, with me. <laughs> then we have Regine Charisma. And Regine is our next step director. She helps all of you take your next step in your service to the Lord and your service to the church. All those people who uh, you saw on the screen today, she personally interviewed and, and, and made sure that they were in agreement with who we are as a bridge and our philosophy of ministry and with our doctrinal position. And she's also our outreach director for events that happen off the campus. She does so much, and all of these folks do far more than what I'm just telling you right now. Then we have Felicia Williams. Let's thank Regine. <laughs> Felicia Williams is our CFO. She's our chief financial officer, as well as working with our team department with her husband, who's one of our pastors, Tavares. And Felicia does an amazing job of making sure all her bills are paid and all the finances here at the church and the offerings count it and all those kind of things. She's the person who does all that. Now, she is taking over, and she's been now with us uh, in that position for quite a few months. But Kevin Bryant, who was our previous CFO, is leaving us at the end of this month. And he wasn't able to be here today. But those of you who might know him, he's been here with us for years and years. He's retiring and moving up to the Orlando area. So let's thank Felicia. Roger Baptiste is our tech director. He does all the tech for the church, the lights, the sound. I mean all kinds of things. The picnic, he's setting up the sound. He was here yesterday. Roger does so many things in helping us to be able to have our communications great in the church. And so let's thank Roger. <laughs> Tommy Van Doren is the head of our maintenance department here at the church. And his right hand and able to work together is Bob Bisbee. And together, they make sure everything is up and running, everything is fixed, the property looks good. They do it all. And, and so let's thank them. I love these people with all of my heart. And I know you love them too. And trust me, they work so hard. They're always willing to go above and beyond. They're always able, ready to go the extra mile. They are dedicated to the Lord. And we are blessed to have them as part of our church. Let's thank them one more time. Thank you. Thank you all. So I want to get back to our series, which really didn't intend to be a series, but we've been getting real lately. We talked about real love. We talked about real freedom. We've talked about real worship for the last couple of weeks. And I could even sense it in you today that, that we're coming here with a whole new disposition. We're coming here with a new intent to really worship God. We're excited to come into his house, to be in the house of the Lord. Today, I want to talk about real salvation. Real salvation. And of all the topics we talked about, this is possibly the most important one. Because what are we talking about when we talk about salvation? We're talking about our eternal destiny. We're talking about where we are going to spend eternity. Are we going to spend eternity with God in the new heaven and the new earth? Or will we spend eternity separated from God in eternal punishment? Our salvation decision makes all the difference in the world. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
He goes on to say, many, let me emphasize that. He goes on to say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. What Jesus is saying here is that not everyone who thinks they're going to make it is really going to make it. Let me say that again. Not everyone who thinks they're going to make it is really going to make it. And I think that's what led the Apostle Paul to write in his first letter to Corinthians this, in 2 Corinthians rather 13.5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So, what is the test? What is the test that characterizes real salvation? Well, I want to share with you Three theological perspectives of what the test is. The first is universal salvation, which says there is no test. It says there is no test. They hold that when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, that he provided forgiveness and the promise of eternal life to every human being before and thereafter everyone's going to make it. And they would cite a scripture like 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. says, for Christ died for sins once for what? For all. The righteous for the unrighteous. To bring you to God. To bring everybody to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Everyone's going to make it. There's no test. There's no reason to examine yourself. It's already been settled. Now, Jesus clearly rejected universal salvation. And we just saw it in Matthew 7 when Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who thinks they're going to make it is going to make it. The second theological position on real salvation is often called lordship salvation. There has to be proof of a real salvation experience. Lordship salvation advocates say that in order to be saved, one must not only believe and acknowledge that Christ is Lord, but also submit to his lordship in all of our life. In other words, there must be, at the moment one trusts in Christ for salvation, at that very moment, a willingness to commit one's life absolutely to the Lord, even though the actual practice of commitment may not follow immediately or even completely over a life. So Lordship Salvation says sinners must exercise faith in conjunction with repentance. And remember, repentance in the original language means a change of the mind, which you should also equate as a change of the life. They would say subsequent behavior. Now that's the test of real salvation. They would say true faith always produces a changed life. Not a change in life. It always produces a changed life. They would cite scriptures like 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is actually in Christ, 
He is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That person is not the same person. The person who was there before Christ is no longer there. The old is gone. The new has come. They might cite 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Lordship salvation advocates would declare, they would ask, is it possible to be a Christian and live in lifelong carnality, enjoying the pleasures of sin and never seeking to glorify the Lord who bought him? Can someone pray a sinner's prayer and go about his life as if nothing happened and still call himself a Christian? Lordship salvation advocates would say, no, heck no. The lordship salvation says, there has to be proof of a real salvation experience. And that proof, that test, is a radically changed life. The third theological perspective of real salvation is grace alone salvation. Salvation is a gift. They would cite Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the what? Gift of God. It's what? Not by works. So grace salvation says that it's the gift of God. It's not at all by works. Grace alone advocates would say God loves, forgives, and saves us not because of who we are or what we do, but because of the work of Christ. Our best efforts can never be good enough for salvation, but God declares us righteous for Christ's sake. They would say we receive that grace through faith alone. God even gives us the faith to trust him. Not only do we receive it by faith alone, but God even gives us the faith to trust him in the first place. We are not saved by obeying a list of do's and don'ts, but by the grace through faith in Christ. Our salvation is totally in God's hands, not our hands. Grace alone salvation says, not faith plus works. They would say, not faith that works. They would say, just faith in who has already worked. John 1.12, they would say, yet to all who received him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They would say, those who believe in Jesus, those who call upon his name, God gives as a gift, and he adopts that person into his personal family, and it's only by what God does and what God is willing to do. Lordship salvation says, faith without proof is just easy believism. Just say a simple prayer. Grace alone says, a demand for proof pollutes the grace of God. If it's by works, then there is no grace of God. We have to prove ourselves. So who's correct? Universal salvation? Lordship salvation? Grace alone salvation? Who's correct? Which view demonstrates real salvation? Well, 
I'm going to share with you my position. I'm going to give you a little Tokarology today. All right? After many, many years of studying the Word of God, after researching every one of these positions diligently, seeking the truth, here's where I land. I know of no biblical example of real salvation that wasn't evidenced by some change in the life of the believer. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So what Paul is saying here to the believers at Ephesus is that one day when you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of sin, that God so loved the world, he gave his one begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, and you believe that, what God instantaneously did and does is he seals our salvation, our real salvation, by depositing inside us the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the Holy Spirit of God is the third member of the Trinity. We have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to think about this. So we put our faith in God, and God indwells us with his spirit, with a member of the Trinity. It is now living inside of us. Now, with that radical of a change, before we trust Christ as our Savior, we are living out of our flesh. There is no presence of the Holy Spirit in us. But now there is. And with that presence of God now indwelling us, my question is, how can that not constitute some change? I know of no biblical example of real salvation that wasn't evidenced by some change in the life of the believer. Probably one of the most dramatic examples is the Apostle Paul. You'll remember that the Apostle Paul's original name was Saul. And Saul was a Jew. He was a high-ranking Jew. And in fact, within the Judaism system, he was a rising star. He was one of the, he was one of the guys on, on the fast track. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling class of the Jewish religion. He, he was someone that everybody was following him. He had the best education. He was going from city to city persecuting those who believed in Jesus Christ. In fact, Scripture says that it was Saul who was holding the cloak of Stephen as an angry crown stoned Stephen to death. Saul is that guy. And one day he's on his way up to the city of Damascus with a writ from the Jewish council in Jerusalem to arrest and imprison people of the way Jesus' followers, and on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him in his Shekinah glory, a bright light. Saul falls on his face, and he says, why do you persecute me? And Jesus said, it is I who you persecute. And Paul got up and trusted that Jesus was indeed the Messiah sent by God to atone for the sins of the world. And he radically changed. He went from imprisoning Christians to preaching the word and at least a third of what we call the New Testament of our Bible was written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by Paul. Paul has been one of the greatest Christian servants and missionaries and pastors the world has ever known. There was a dramatic change in his life. Recognize by the believers in Galatia. In Galatians 1.23, said they heard the report, the Christians in the city of Galatia. They heard this man was coming, this Saul was coming. 
He said, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. There was a radical change in his life when he believed in Jesus Christ and was possessed by the Holy Spirit. Probably one of the most subtle changes was the thief on the cross. You remember Jesus crucified is hanging between two thieves. And in Mark chapter 15, verse 29, says those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it again in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. They're mocking Jesus. They're ridiculing Jesus. Verse 32 says, those who were crucified with him also helped and heaped insults on him. So the two thieves, they were doing the same thing. If you're the Christ, come down at the cross and save us. They were mocking him too. But later in Luke's gospel, we see something happens. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. He continues to do it. But the other criminal all of a sudden rebukes him. Don't you fear God, he said? since you are under the same sentence of death? See, this second thief, I believe, that as he witnessed this guy next to him, Jesus, being crucified on the cross, and hearing Jesus declare, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, his heart was changed. In fact, he cried out to Jesus later after mocking him, said, Master, remember me today when you enter paradise. And Jesus said to him, today you will be in paradise with me. It was a subtle change, but it was a change. Both Paul and the thief manifested some level of change. Paul, a radical lifestyle change. The thief, a momentary last breath change. But both were the recipients of real salvation. Has your eternal experience manifested any change in you? Has it made any difference? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourself. Test yourself. Do you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So what should we ask ourselves? How should we examine ourselves? Well, one question we should ask is this is, what is your attitude towards God? How do you feel about God? What is your attitude towards serving God and worshiping God? 1 John 1, 6 says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So in our relationship with God, is it a big burden? Oh, I got to get up and go to church. Oh, they want me to read my Bible. Oh, they want me to give an offering. Oh, they want me to serve in a ministry. I mean, like, is it a big burden? Is God an obligation? Another question is, how do you respond towards sin? When you sin, and we all sin, how do you respond towards that? 1 John 3, 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed, the Holy Spirit, abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, I want you to understand that what this is not saying is that even a true believer cannot enter into prolonged periods of sinfulness. That's not what it's saying. And I know it says making a practice of sin. But here's really the truth behind this passage. Is that if we have a real salvation experience and the Holy Spirit of God legitimately lives inside us, we cannot continue to sin without grieving that spirit. We cannot sin like we used to sin before the Holy Spirit was there, because now the Holy Spirit is pounding on our conscience, it's pounding on our mind, it's pounding on our soul, it's pounding on our spirit, that we are way out of line. Now, over a long period of time, we can numb that sense, we can numb that voice, 
But whenever God sees a moment of tenderheartedness in us, the Holy Spirit will come back. What is your attitude towards other believers? Oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't like to hang around those church people. I don't like those believers. You know, they're, they're kind of out there. 1 John 4.20 says, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. You like hanging out? You like life group? Are your friends believers or are all your friends unbelievers? Because you just aren't comfortable around all those believer people. Do you sense the Holy Spirit's presence in you at all? We see he dwells us. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. If we have a real salvation experience, we have that spirit. And that spirit is moving. That spirit is alive in us. And we sense it through conviction. We sense it through guidance. We sense it through peace. We sense it through love. We sense it through direction. We sense it because the Holy Spirit is at work in us. Speaking to us what God has spoken to the Holy Spirit about us. Are you drawn towards the things of God subsequent to that prayer of faith in Jesus Christ? If your answer to these questions produce no evidence of change, I want you to know it still doesn't necessarily mean that you are not saved. Now, I'll tell you what it does mean is I don't want to do your funeral. Because I don't know where you're at. But it doesn't necessarily, but if there is no evidence of change, better test yourself. Better examine yourself. Now, I also hold... That salvation is by grace alone through faith in what Jesus did on the cross. And if I'm going to choose which one of those that I'm going to put my all in, it's going to be this one. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace you have been saved. That word grace means the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in salvation. And so it is by the free and unmerited power and grace of God that we have been saved. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 10. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Why? Because he is a God of grace. He's a God of grace, for by grace you have been saved. Again, God has given this gift, but has he given this gift to everybody? Now we're back to universal salvation. No. It's by grace you have been saved. Read it with me. Through faith. Through faith. That's the one condition on our part. Through faith. Faith, something that is believed, especially with strong conviction, especially a system of religious beliefs. Hebrews 11 once says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We just believe God. It doesn't make sense. We don't always feel warm and fuzzy about it. But we just believe it because God said it and God settled it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Through faith. Through faith. You say, faith in what? Wrong question. It's faith in who? John three sixteen and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one only son that whoever... Whoever in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not 
believe in the name of God's one and only Son. Believes what? First, believes what Jesus said about himself. John 8, verses 23 through 24, Jesus continued, You are from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Jesus says, if you don't believe what I've told you about myself, I guarantee you, you're going to die in your sins. See, because Jesus has said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. Second, we have to believe what God has declared Jesus to be. 1 John 5, verse 10. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. What has God said? God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's what God says about the whole thing. Acts 4.12. God says salvation is found in no one else. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That means Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Read it. You will be saved. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, read it with me, that you may know you have eternal life. If you are truly a believer, then you truly believe. So if you have believed God, You are truly saved. You've had a real salvation experience. I know some of you are going, whew, I've done that. Well, then how do you feel about 1 John 3? No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. And you go, no, no, I do continue to sin. So am I really not a believer at all? See you next week. We're talking about real salvation, folks. Now, I gave you the biblical formula for real salvation. Next week, I'm going to take on this insecurity that people who have had a real salvation experience often struggle with in life. I know I have. We're going to take that on next week and how that relates to a real salvation experience. But as we prepare to end our service today, I want to appeal to everyone here on campus and all of you who are streaming with us. Have you had that real salvation experience? Do these characteristics of those who have had that experience resonate with you in your head and in your heart and in your spirit and in your soul? 
Paul says, examine yourself, test yourself to see if you're in the faith because this is the most important decision you are ever going to make. Now, if you're here and you're kind of spinning now, you go, I don't think I am. Then I want to give you a resource before you leave. Those here on campus, go out the center doors, go to your left. There's a TV screen mounted on the wall. Under that TV screen is a basket of little thin beige brown paperback books and the title is You Can Be Sure. Take one of those with you and read that this week. It will walk you through everything I've talked about and so much more. It's really a thin book. It's not a big book. Take it for free. And it will reveal to you, once again, everything the Bible, the Word of God has told us and promised us about eternal life and real salvation. If you're streaming with us today, go to our website, gobridgechurch.org, and go to I Want to Meet Jesus, and those same materials will be there for you online. Thank you, God, that you have not left us without direction, that you have not left us without clear, clear scripture that tells us what real salvation is and what it's not. God, I pray that every man and woman here and streaming with us has made that decision. If not, I pray that they would seek out those resources and study those resources and make today their day of salvation by confessing with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in their heart that God has raised him from the dead. Lord, anoint us with your presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Before we sing, I want to share one more opportunity with you. You know, coming out of the pandemic, and we still are, one of the international issues that have come up and are being explored and, and, and are trying to be treated every day is mental health issues. We didn't come out of the pandemic healthy. Now, we here at the bridge have a wellness ministry. We have classes for people who are dealing with challenges in life, like grief share for people who have lost a loved one, like divorce care for people who have gone through a divorce, like Financial Peace University that helps people who are in the bondage of financial bondage and can't find a way out. And we also, yesterday at the health fair, we kicked off, we introduced, although we've been already doing it here for, for several months, a ministry that we call Mind Masters Ministry. And my wife, Stella, is directing that ministry. And that ministry is all about helping people who are dealing with fear and dealing with depression and dealing with anxiety, but it's also helping people who don't want to deal with depression and fear and anxiety, and they want to head it off. So they don't get there. So it's both a proactive ministry and it's a reactive ministry to help people who are either struggling with issues that fall under the mental health category or who just don't want to ever get there and do as much as they can to prevent that. So this Saturday, this coming Saturday, from 8.30 to 12.30, Stella is going to host a workshop called You Happier. Anyone like a little bit more happiness in your life? You, happier. Now, you can still register for it. Go to our website, gobridgechurch.org, and go to upcoming events, and you'll see it there, and you can still register. Let's help each other. You know, Scripture says that we're better together than we are isolated, because if one of us falls down, the others can help us up, and we all fall down. And so this ministry is to help people up, and it's also to help people from falling down. And I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited about the change we're seeing in people who have already been exposed to it. I love you, church. Let's stand. Let's praise the Lord one more time. Lord willing, see you next week.
wonderful week. Go shout out his praise all week long. We'll see you back next Sunday. to you.